Welcome to episode 317 of the AMPM podcast. In today's episode, my guest is Arnold Shields. Arnold is from Australia, where he's a chartered accountant, which is similar to a CPA in the U.S. He's got close to 600 clients that he works with that are e-commerce, primarily Amazon sellers, as well as he's a seller himself doing several million dollars per year on Amazon. So he really knows this business and he really knows this game. And more importantly, he really knows his numbers. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Not the most exciting thing. It's not the glamour of selling on Amazon and all the cool pictures and video and everything. It's all about the numbers, but it's crucial that you understand this. And hopefully after listening to today's episode, you're going to revisit some of what you're doing and take a good hard look and make sure you you know your numbers. Welcome to the AMPM podcast. Welcome to the AMPM podcast. Where we explore opportunities in e-commerce. E-commerce. We dream big and we discover what's working right now. Plus, plus, this is the podcast where money never sleeps. Working around the clock in the AM and the PM. Are you ready for today's episode? I said, I said are, are you, you ready? Ready. Let's do this. Let's do this. Here's your host, Here's your host Kevin King. Kevin King. Arnold Shields, welcome to the AMPM podcast. I'm happy to have you here, man. Welcome. It's fantastic to be here, Kevin. It, it has. When was the last time we saw each other? I think the Billion Dollar Solar Summit, right? Yeah, 2019. I know. And then you bought an early bird pass to like the next one. Then COVID hit, and so you couldn't come. And then I remember uh, you were you were eager to come back to this this last one. And, and you're looking at these airfares because you're coming from, from Oz down in Australia. And it was like some crazy amount of money to actually fly here. And, and you're a taller guy. So, you know, economy seats are just not going to cut it uh, for a 15, 16 hour flight. So I'm looking forward to hopefully maybe seeing you at uh, the event uh, next year. Yeah, no, it sounds good. Puerto Rico, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Puerto Rico, exactly. In, uh, in June. Yeah, it sounds good. I'd love to be there. Awesome. Well, let's uh, tell everybody, a lot of people probably don't know who you are. They may have taken the Freedom Ticket course, and they, they may have seen that you have a little module in the Freedom Ticket where you're talking about uh, a bunch of numbers and spreadsheets and stuff. But tell me a little bit about yourself. What brings you to this Amazon game, this e-commerce game? Well, I'm an, I'm an accountant, so we've got a, a chartered accounting practice. Um, and, yeah, we specialize now in Amazon businesses. But uh, – a long time ago now, about 2015, I had uh, someone I knew come to me and said, oh, I've done this Amazon course, you know, and they were doing lots of different, you know, internet courses at the time, and they said, oh, I think it might be okay, and uh, just can you have a look at it and see how, it, you know, our numbers are going, and they'd actually done fantastically well in their first year. This is back in 2015, and we got a couple more clients after that, and then we just kind of basically said, well... I was using one of their accounts to go in and check which reports we had to download. And I thought, oh, this is a bit silly. Why don't we just set up our own product and kind of order 500 units? It's just something that we kind of need anyway. And if it sells, great. If it doesn't, well, we'll give them away as, you know, corporate corporate merch. So that was 2016. And that product just started selling. So we've been selling consistently now for since 2016. So in 2015, you were just minding your business. You're just an accountant down in Australia. Which part of Australia? In Sydney. So you're just an accountant in Sydney, just dealing with a bunch of stuff. Somebody comes to you, an Australian seller that was probably selling in the U.S. It yeah. Comes to you and says, hey, I need some uh, accounting work done. Says, I'm selling on this on Amazon in the U.S. You're like, you may have like, oh, okay, that's great. And you take a look at it. And you, it looks interesting to you. So you're like, you know what? I want to dabble in this as well. Let me see, uh, you know, what I can figure out and just did it almost on a lark just to kind of figure out uh, how the system works. And, and now that's turned into actually a business that's still running and you're still doing the accounting for a bunch of people on the side. Yeah. So we've got five or six hundred Amazon clients. Uh, and yeah, the, the businesses, we, we kind of said in the beginning, we're just going to grow this organically. So we're not going to put extra money in. So we put in, a, you know, I think it was about 12 grand at the, at the beginning. And it's grown from there. It's now a multi-million dollar Amazon business. So it's kind of fun. And now are you running that yourself or do you have a team that's under you and you're just kind of supervising or uh, what? Or No, I'm just running it myself. I'm about to get a team on. It's, it's got a bit more serious now. So I've got to, I've got to get a team on to um, do some of the things. There's, some things are just annoying in Amazon. <laughs> Seller Central, it just takes some time. 
Um, so we're just getting a team in place to do some of that stuff. So you're, you're going in there yourself and actually creating the shipping plans and, and doing the PPC and all that kind of stuff and, and checking the customer service. Yeah. How many how many SKUs is it uh, in, in this account? Uh, we've got 20 SKUs now. Okay. And, and so just selling in the U.S.? Just Well, we're actually in the U.K. and Europe as well. Kind of a messy place there at the moment. Um, not that keen on that one. So we're just probably going to just concentrate in the U.S. for a bit longer. But no Australia? A bit in Australia, but it's only uh, what's in the garage type thing. <laughs> it's just not much, not much volume down <laughs> the, there. <laughs> the, 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 le- the leftover samples, you know, you you, you get a, you, you buy a, you know, when you get a sh- an order done, you might say, "Oh, let's ship one box back here, and we'll get some photos done." And then you, you've got you know, you take two out for samples and photography, and you've got another box. So I can ship them off to Amazon Australia and see how they go. It's not a big market. It's it really takes the focus away. eBay's a big market still for a lot of Australians when it comes to e-commerce. Is that correct? Yeah, it's just it's a different type of stuff you get on eBay as well. It's probably the same in the US, but eBay is much bigger. But Amazon's catching up quickly. Australia has a big Amazon seller community, I and mean, you got the End Game Network down there. You got uh, some other big uh, outfits. Uh, so most of those people are selling in the US then, primarily. Absolutely. Unless they're just beginning, yeah? Okay, we're just starting out, seeing how it's going. You know, going into Amazon Australia is a very cheap way to get into the whole Amazon marketplace. Now, with five to 600, you said, clients on the accounting side. So are you, uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, there's CPAs. What's the CPA equivalent in, in Australia? Is there something similar to that? Yeah, so chartered accountants is similar to CPAs in Australia. Okay, so you, you have a team then of, like, bookkeepers and people that are doing the books, and then you're, yeah. since you're the chartered accountant, you're just... Doing the final sign-off, basically. Yeah, I've got a team of chartered accountants as well. Oh, okay. So, um, okay. <laughs> yeah. So they kind of handle that stuff, and I kind of look towards. They handle all the tax and all the compliance stuff, and I kind of look at more strategic direction of, of people's businesses. So there's probably quite a bit of stuff. If you're dealing, are most of your clients Australian sellers, or do you have people from all over the world? Most of them are Australian sellers. We get some international sellers coming to Australia, but most of them are Australian sellers. So they probably like that then because then you can come in and you can hone, you, you know, okay, the U.S. tax stuff so you can help them with uh, that, uh, the, the navigate that process that uh, if, if they're based in the, in the U.S. especially, uh, that a lot of them might be foreign to them or might be scary to them. You can really h- kind of hold their hand and make sure they feel comfortable and safe doing that. Would that be correct? Absolutely. Plus, because we've been running an Amazon business, you know, quite a successful Amazon business, we're one of our most successful clients. Because we've been running it, we know everything they're spending their money on. We know where the pitfalls are and, you know, when to change things, when to keep on going, when to slow down, when to speed up. So your product, what category are you in? The the product that you have, that you personally have? We're in office products. In office products, Okay. And was that? Why do you? Th- what do you think the the key to that success was? You said you started out with about five hundred, and now it's it's a. You said I think an eight figure business. Is that correct? Yeah. No, we're doing a couple of million a year. Okay. So yeah. seven, a good a good healthy seven figure business. Were you right place, right time in twenty sixteen, or is there something that was it luck or something that you did that made that uh, that actually take off uh, to your surprise? I think it was just a case of. All the things you need to do properly. I mean, we've launched more products since then, and they've, they've some of them have gone okay. But I think some of them have done very well. So I think it's just getting in those basics of making sure you've got a good converting page. But one of the the basics that when it comes to is, I mean, there's lots of basics in the the sexy stuff about the marketing and the converting pages and the videos and all that. But one of the basics that a lot of people overlook. Is the financial side, and I don't know how many. I know you 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 do all kinds of spreadsheets, and you have stuff that you offer for free to sellers. And I'm sure you have some more advanced stuff that maybe you help with your clients. And you did the, the module on the Freedom Ticket. That's uh, all you know. It's a spreadsheet, so anybody that has access to Helium 10, you can go. Freedom Ticket is free. You can go in there and you can find Arnold's um, module in there, and there's there's some spreadsheets and stuff there. And I think he may have a couple others that he's going to share as well in, in, a, in a little bit. But that's so important that most people just they don't do that. You, you, they watch a course or YouTube video and it says, yeah, yeah, you're selling it for 20 bucks. You can buy it from the factory for three bucks. You know, Amazon's going to take a couple of dollars, a 15% commission. Look at these profits. You're making, a, you know, $13 on every one of them that you're selling or something. And they forget like everything. And like, that's cool. So if I spend $5,000, I'm going to make, a, you know, it's got this kind of ROI. I'm going to make $10,000. Cool. I'm off to the races. Here's my life savings of five grand. 
And then, boom, two months later, they're broke as a skunk. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, they're out of stock. Why is it that so many people can't understand the financial side? Is it just because it's numbers? Is it because they don't understand? Because nobody teaches it? Because it's not sexy? What is it about about this that, that always stumbles people? I think it's, it's a case of there's a couple of things. One is it's the first one is about cash flow. Every business is about cash flow. And in an Amazon business, it basically means you've got to be making, understanding what that cash flow means. So we see a lot of people who will grow really quickly and then basically have no money, go out of stock. So it's about tempering that business. So quite often we're talking with people about you don't need to grow super fast or you can't afford to grow super fast. You've got to slow it down. And that's really um, where we started with, you know, where we met a long time ago was one of the first spreadsheets I did was just explaining how that cash flow model works. Because in the first really three or four years, any money that you profit so you make, you've just got to buy more and more stock. Mm -hmm. And you've got to keep on doing that for quite a while to just build up that level of stock that you need. I think so many people get into this where they think that they're, this is, they want to quit their day job or their other job and like, oh, if I can do this, I can, you know, start taking a salary and living high on the hog uh, six months or three months from now. And it just, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we, we did some studies on our, our clients and so um, converted to basically US dollars. If all our clients who were, had sales of over $700,000 a year were able to pay themselves a salary and none of them under $700,000 were able to pay themselves. Wow. So basically, if you were under 700000 you couldn't afford to pay yourself a salary. But if you're over $700,000 in sales, they all paid themselves a salary. Where do you see that salary scale? So if I'm $700,000, am I, I mean, I know there's there's lots of variables in this, but just as a kind of a rule of thumb for someone listening that's maybe just starting out, if I got to 700000 what could I maybe expect? You know, is that a thirty thousand dollar, fifty thousand dollar salary? Maybe if you know, depending on if you got some good numbers, or is it I can make a hundred thousand? Or what? What? Where do you see that most of the sellers need to be at to actually start making? You know, let's say let's say a hundred grand a year uh, that they can put actually into their pocket and pay their bills and pay their rents. Where where are they assuming? You know, that, you know, there, there's a number of variables, but just on average, where would that uh, where yeah, would that be? Okay. So you've got two factors there. One is you've got to, so every time you take out money out of the business, then that is money that you can more pay for stock. So at some point, the business has got to be big enough and it works out about that 700,000 to a million dollars in sales, where at that point, you've got enough money, the, the business should be generating enough money that it can have enough to pay a salary and also have enough to fund growth. So if you want to pull out a you know, pull out a hundred thousand, uh, you probably I would say you're probably looking at about one and a half million dollars in sales. In top line to pull out a hundred. Top thousand. line gross sales. Yeah, yeah, I would I would say that's about that's about right. To, um, it depends on your turnover and depends on your margins and a, a few other uh, factors in there. But I would say that's about right. So these people that are you said you started with twelve thousand dollars back when when you launched your 500, yeah. 500 units. Do you think it's possible in today's world to start with with less with twelve thousand dollars or less, and actually grow a business uh, on Amazon, or if can you start with twelve thousand? It's just going to be a slow climb, and maybe you'll have some beer money uh, on the side. Or can you? What, what do you think that it's evolved over the last six or seven years since you started? Okay, since I started, there's a couple of things, and this has happened in the last two years. Is the profit margins reduced? So before we were looking at net profit margins. Yeah, after advertising, after all expenses kind of in that 25 to 30 percent range for private label uh, for private label yes definitely for private label and in the last two years we've seen that drop to probably 18 to 22 so there's freight costs increased PPC a bit more competition driven the margins down a bit so it makes it a bit slower but yes you can start with a, a smaller amount um, yeah probably probably not 12 maybe 20. Um, thousand Aussie, so fifteen thousand US, but it just means you have to go slower. It means the first year you're getting you know, fifty to hundred grand in sales. The next year you're getting two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in sales. The next year five hundred thousand dollars in sales, or you can put more money in. Yeah, but you can you can just do that. It's it's about 
having realistic ex expectations of what that growth level is. Because the faster you grow, the more cash the business is going to need. So if you can grow slower, and growing slower in Amazon business is you know, doubling it every year, as opposed to going from you know, 200,000 to a million, you can't do that organically. So if, I, if I've got five grand, I'm in a, you know, I live in, a, you know, I don't live in the U.S. I live in maybe Pakistan or South America or somewhere like that. And I've got like five grand saved up or I can borrow it from a, from my family members. Should I be starting an Amazon business? Are there still opportunities there, do you think? Or is it just going to be such a slow climb that, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to really make any money on this for, for a while, most likely? You're not going to be making on it a while anyway. So even if you've got more money, it's still three or four years before you can realistically expect to. You might pay back that five grand, but it would be, it's going to be a few years anyway before that money comes out, before you can pay yourself a salary from the business. At five grand, what we're telling, you know, like our clients um, who are in Australia who haven't got as much, they, we say, okay, start on Amazon Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Start building up, build up that experience. And what you really want to do is you want to turn that five grand into 10 grand into twenty thousand dollars yeah and building up those inventory levels so you got enough the issue you could go into if you're in pakistan would, could you try an amazon singapore or amazon uae just to get your feet wet and learn the system and learn how it works and just to, to get somewhere it's not so competitive and don't have to do such a big yeah <laughs> yeah uh, rather than you know going into amazon usa and just getting it's always a tricky thing picking products and you know, you might think you've got a great one but find out it's cutthroat. Um, you can do your money pretty quickly if you're not quite sure. So when a new client comes to you uh, and says, hey, uh, I've heard some good things about your firm. You know, we'd like you to take a look at our, our handle, start handling our books. What are some just disasters that you see? You, you, someone comes to you and they're maybe doing a million, three million, five million, and, you, and you, you take a look and you're like, holy shit, this is just a freak show here. This is just a mess. What are some big mistakes you see a lot of sellers just constantly making when, they, when they're when they coming to you when it comes to the accounting side of things? Okay. Consistently is drop shipping. Okay. That just is a world of pain. <laughs> um, there's no margins in drop shipping. So I, I've got very few people doing that, but when we get those ones, it is always a world of pain. Um, it may work well in the US in, from working drop shipping from Australia just doesn't work. In terms of, it's mainly where people have gone basically too hard with things. You know, they've gone, yes, we're fully psyched up for this. We're going in and they've, they've probably gone in and said, we're going to discount our product. You now, this is what we quite often see. So they'll go in as a, a cheap start. So they'll order a, a lot of units. They'll try and muscle their way into the market by starting off with a really cheap price, hoping to increase it later. The problem with that is everything about their listing is designed for the cheap price and they haven't actually worked out whether it actually converts at a higher price. Then they place another order because sales are so fantastic at that cheap price, they try and sell it at a higher price and it's just gone. I think the other one, uh, and so they just can't sell, they end up with you know, 5,000 units of a product that just is not going to sell at the price they want. So do you have a lot of clients that come to you that think they're doing well and then within a few months or six months or a year, they're not a client anymore, they're out of business? Not many like that. Because no, most of them do these pretty good courses. Now, there's, there's some, in Australia, there's a couple of good courses around that really do train them properly in terms of what to expect and you know, don't go too hard on it. Don't order 5,000 silicon spatulas. Just take it easy, order 500 units, sell that 500, get some more, build it up slowly. Um, and Freedom Ticket's the same thing. They don't push them. You, you're not giving them wrong advice and things. Um, so that's the mistakes we go at where people are probably go really hard on something. They've got more money to spend. They're really keen to make this a success and they push a lot of money in without learning the basics first. So when I, I know you create a lot of spreadsheets, like you have a cash flow spreadsheet and the freedom ticket. And I think that's how I first found out about you back, maybe it's 2016, 2017, you were doing like a little, I don't know how it got on your list, but I think there's like seven listeners or something like that. And you, you would offer like a, uh, you would do this little recording and 20, 20 minute thing. And you'd walk some way through a little spreadsheet like that, man, there's nobody doing this out there. Nobody is actually showing 
uh, giving the spreadsheets. You know, they're all on these webinars and stuff just saying it's $20 to sell on Amazon, $3 to buy it from Alibaba. Look at you at $17 profit. Uh, and uh, you can, yes, you can start with $500. And, uh, you know, if you buy my course, I'll give you another $500 off the discount. So you have now $1,000 uh, or whatever, you know, just crazy stuff like that. But you came up with a spreadsheet that's like mapped it out for like, I think, three to five years or something like that. Yeah. How, how do, and it showed you like your account, your, your checking account, you like, you start with this and okay, if you order this much and this is your price, this, your checking account's going to go negative. Uh, you know, on this date, and you're going to have to call your rich uncle and say, hey, I need a quick loan, or you're going to have to go sell the car or, or whatever. And I was like, nobody is showing this kind of stuff. And this this needs to be taught because people have a, a wrong, like you said earlier, the, um, the wrong expectation. But what if I don't know what my costs are? I might, uh, a lot of the projections are just guessing. Uh, so what? how can I best manage that? If, if I'm new at this and I'm just trying to project out, um, how, how can I best manage that to, to try to have a realistic view of what I really need to do? Okay, there's, there's a couple of easy, w the, the reason what, okay, going back to that spreadsheet, the reason we initially developed it is because people were saying, oh, if I just make a dollar profit, then it's okay. I said, well, you know, okay, that's wrong because <laughs> the issue is if, you're, if your profits are not high enough, um, you are you're going to need ten thousand dollars this year, but you're going to need fifty thousand dollars the next year, and two hundred thousand dollars the next year to keep on running this business. Um, so, getting back to that issue of you know that financial information they need, it's really and the forecasting, it's really just getting a feel for it yourself. I mean, at some point you end up taking a risk. That first product is always a risk. You've got no idea whether it's going to sell or not. But just saying, okay, I've got five hundred units there. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, seven hundred and fifty units. You can just keep on building up from that. I usually tell people not to. In the first year, their object is to get that first product stable, so the inventory is stable on that. That's their object for the first year. If they try and launch too many products in the first year, they basically run out of money. And then the next year, you've got, yeah, you know, you've got probably the second and third product, and a lot of the the, the forecasts are really just based on, okay, how many products do we realistically, how many units are we realistically going to sell a day per product? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's a hundred, sometimes it's ten, but you, know, you can get a quite a good business just selling ten units a day. Yeah, you can. Sometimes it's not about, it's not about the the quantity you sell. It's about how you're selling or how what the margins are. So it's a lot of times you can actually sell less and make more money. And selling more, and a lot of people don't realize that they just see big dollar signs. I need they see people showing screenshots of, of high sales amounts, but you have no idea what their take home is off of that, or if that was in the middle of a launch and a giveaway or, or some sort of promotion or something when they're showing these screenshots, or the price was low, like you said earlier, someone comes in really really low, and then when they try to raise it up, it, it just falls. Uh, it's a house of cards and falls down. So what are like three? The, probably if you had to tell people like the three most important financial things that they need to know, whether they're an ex a brand new seller or they're an experienced seller, what are the three numbers that, that you've got to freaking know uh, or you uh, backwards and forwards in your business? Okay. So the first one is your gross profit rate. So that's your sales, less your Amazon costs, less your cost of your product, um, down to that gross profit rate. You need to understand that that needs to be at least over thirty percent. So what, what's so let's if, let's back that just to break that down. So so that that percentage is you said it's the cost of the item. So whatever I'm paying my factory, the cost of the shipping, right, and taxes and whatever yes. it's, whatever it takes to get it in, and that would include like if it's just if the shipping price might be you know, you're paying I don't know five thousand dollars to your broker to get it to California from a, a factory in China. But then you got to get it from California into uh, all Amazon's warehouses. You got to include that price, that cost too. You're including a, a tacos, or a, a percentage of something that you're assigning to advertising, or no, into that. Not at this point. Not at this point. Because you, okay, you, you can. Yeah. Okay, so you're not including so, that. So then you're including um, any inspection cost. Any are you including any fixed cost in, in that at all? Like uh, your package design or any of that kind of stuff? Generally not, because that's usually a once-off. It's sunk cost, right. um, but then it's going to be FBA costs. Okay, so it's fulfillment fees, be, storage fees. Uh, yes, seller commission, mm -hmm. um, fifteen percent. 
should also take into account refunds, um, that refund percentage. If you've got a 6% refund rate, it's probably costing you about 2% of sales. Um, so should I just factor in? I don't know what my refund, if I'm selling clothing, my refund or something with size of my refund might, rate might be 20, 30%. It could but, be. but if I'm, what should I just, uh, before I know the refund rate, um, you know, I'll figure that out later on. But before I know that, what's a good just ballpark number just to pencil in? 2% two, two of sales. Okay. If, if, unless you're in fashion. Okay. And then it'll be higher. Okay. Um, but 2% of sales is a good number to be with. And so, yeah, all those costs. And then so it's, you end up the gross profit, which is sales less all those costs mm -hmm. equals your gross profit. Then your gross profit rate is your gross profit divided by your sales. And that needs to be ideally above 30%, you said? Over 30%. Okay. If you're, if you're under 30%, you're going to have cash flow problems. Okay. Okay. So that's number, that's number one, uh, that you got you got to know that yep. number. Okay. okay. What's number two? Okay. The second one is tacos. You've got to have a, an understanding of what your tacos is. A lot of people kind of, and that needs to, it may not be, it needs to be moving in the right direction you want it to be. So if you're just launching a product, your tacos is going to be horrible, but you want to be having a system so that that tacos does come down. Just to explain that for someone that listening that may not know what tacos is, it's, it's your A cost, which is advertising cost of sale. Which So if, if I sell an item for $20 and it costs me $2 in advertising, maybe I'm, I'm spending uh, 20 cents a click and it took 10 clicks to make a sale, that's a two, that, that that two dollars divided into the twenty—that's a ten percent a cost. But on well, top on on top of that, though, is maybe I I sold one by advertising, and also at the same time, someone just found me organically. I didn't have to pay an ad, and they clicked on it. So I, I sold two units, uh, and so then instead of a ten percent, it's now five percent, and that's where the taco. So it's the total advertising for all the sales, not just the sales generated from from what you sold because you advertised. So I just want to explain that for, for those that may not understand that. So that so he's saying that the talk back on tacos, you got to know this number. So go ahead. Yep. So, I mean, that's going to be different along the way, depending on what we find is businesses that have really high gross profit rates generally will have a high tacos as well. But businesses with a, that are successful that have a low gross profit rate will generally have a low tacos. Um, but you've got to understand that and what that number is and which direction it's going. If you've got a product that's got a really high price on it, well, you're going to be advertising more for that. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a premium product, you're not automatically going to be showing on the top of top of the ranking because your product's too expensive. So you've really got to advertise there. So those ones will have more or higher things. It comes back to the point where your net profit, you know, your net contribution margin which is your gross profit, less your tacos, that needs to be around 20%. Okay. So a tacos, that's about a 10% tacos then? Yeah, so 30%, yep. So 10%, 10 tacos, and yep. like you said, when you first start out, that might be 100% because you're having to get some positioning and you're having to introduce the product and get that get, get it going. But over time, you should be shooting for somewhere in 10% or less uh, on your tacos. Would that be fair? Well, it you should be moving towards a 20% contribution rate. Okay. That's where the market seems to be sitting at the moment. Okay. Um, and 20% will generally mean that you can grow your business and have enough profits there to buy more stock. So if my gross profit is 35%, then I might have room for like a 15% in there to get to that 20% ideal that you're saying on, on yep. the contribution margin. Okay. Yep, absolutely. And we see our clients just range all the way through that. We have got clients who have got, you know, doing, and this is for the bigger clients, not the ones who are starting. They, they range all around the place, but that's kind of how they ended up. You know, it ended up being, you know, around just over 22% profit margin after advertising. And then on average, I think it was about a 15% tacos. Okay. And what would, what's the number three thing that everybody needs to pay attention to? I think the next one, and the next one is something for, especially for bigger players. It is their inventory rate. So basically your inventory at cost divided by your sales. 
and there's no special number for this. It's going to be different for everybody and everyone's things. But you want that to be moving downwards because that is where everyone's, you know, you made all these profits, you've got this big business and it's all sitting in inventory. You know, you, you want it in cash. So if you can make your inventory, your supply chain more efficient, basically you're turning that inventory into cash much quicker. It's not, that's not about inventory turns. That, that's, that's a different figure. This is more of, of how much you've in, this is almost like an ROI kind of thing. Like how much, how fast can you turn what you invest and how big can you make that and how fast can you make that? Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's very similar to inventory returns. It's just a, an easier way of looking at it. You know, you, the inventory at cost divided by sales and it's a number just for you. But if you can lower that, you know, it's just going to free up cash. So what we're doing with our business is you know, because I was running it myself and it was kind of easy, I'd be ordering stock every three months. Yeah, order stock every three months, ship it into Amazon, ship it into a 3PL directly into Amazon, and that was kind of the system. It, it ends up a bit inefficient in a way because I'm kind of guessing where the next you know, sales of the months two and three, and it's kind of six months out anyway. Um, so it's, it's a lot of guessing. So what we're doing is looking at sh- placing orders monthly um, and sending in to Amazon basically weekly. And with that, we should be able to reduce our stock requirement by half. So we can sell. So why do you think a lot of people just don't pay attention to this? Just because it's boring and they don't like doing numbers? Or why, why, do, why is so many people, they just they not pay attention? This is a core fundamental key to your, your success. And so many people ignore it. Why, why do you think that is? Uh, one, it's difficult. Well, it's not that difficult, but it does require more work. But it's not, it's not sexy and fun. This is just the hard-nosed business side of it. We're coming down to inven- the efficiency of your inventory and efficiency of cash. But that's something we're seeing across the board. And for most Amazon businesses out there, unless they're concentrating actually on doing that, they're probably sitting with – they could halve the amount of inventory they've got. So if, you, if they had $400,000 of inventory – they could probably do the same job with $200,000 worth, but that means there's $200,000 extra cash for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just a matter of looking at it a different way. So that's what we've started to do this year. That's kind of been a, a big focus. And it was difficult to do in the last two years. You know, the last two years on supply chain was just horrible. Um, Amazon bought in their variety of inventory restrictions, it was slow getting product in, uh, you know, shipping prices went through the roof, you couldn't find containers, all those type of things. So it was really difficult to put that in place in the last two years. But the combination of the extra competition, the declining margins, mean that you have to become more efficient with your inventory if you want to continue to succeed in it. So do you think it takes a different mindset depending on the level of seller you are? You know, if th- there's one mindset when it comes to maybe the financial side at zero to half a million, another mindset up to five million or another mindset when it's 10 million plus, or is it all pretty much the same fundamental stuff or, or is there any shift that needs to happen? Oh, there's definitely a couple of different mindsets. Um, you'll see it quite often, you know, you, you get someone who's a fantastic product developer and they can develop all these products and they, they create beautiful successful products but then when you get to the one million dollar mark you know five million dollar mark then it becomes an issue of okay we've got to do inventory management (laughs) it becomes an issue Mm -hmm. once you get over that point you're suddenly going okay this is an inventory management type of game now so you're then looking at saying well you've got a bunch of products you've got to keep them all in stock you've got to keep them flowing through the process keeping that efficient almost becomes a a full-time job. And what we're quite often saying is uh, the position, you know, you've got sales up to a million, you can basically run it and you can run the business reasonably inefficiently. Then from one million to five million, it becomes an inventory game. You need to, at that point, you need to be putting on staff and one of those staff is going to be inventory management. And then from five million plus, it's a whole combination of new things in there. Um, 
it, it becomes far more of a um, inventory cash flow. You, you've got to just add those next people in and you've got to start looking for different areas um, to go. A lot of people actually pull out, you know, they cash in at the 2 million to 5 million mark because they don't want to have to then grow this big team that you need to at 5 at five to 10 million needs a team. And so you end- So you see that's where the, the big adjustment happens when it starts getting scary and starts getting, becoming real and not just uh, something you can like, like you're doing, you know, a one man show doing a couple million a year. When it starts actually becoming a true like enterprise, that's when a lot of people say, "Okay, I'll sell to an aggregator or sell to somebody on uh, one of the, uh, you know, through one of the brokers or something like that, just so they don't have to go down that rabbit hole." Absolutely, absolutely, and that's one of the, you know, when you get to, you know, five million, then it's it's then having a people business. You're no longer being a an inventory management person or a content creator or you know this great designer. It's like okay, you've got to manage a team. Yeah, and you've got to have all these people doing all these different things. Um, and that's where I think the difference is coming in. And some people just, they don't want to be running a team. They just love running their little business themselves. So if I, if I go down that route, I start my business, I build it to two to, let's say I build it to four or five million. I'm like, okay, I'm done. I, I want to put this up for sale. I'm going to throw it out there. Maybe an aggregator buy it. Maybe one of the brokers will, will sell it on one of the sites. And then, then, and those people, I, I find some leads, some some people that are interested. Maybe I go go under LOI, and then they want to look at my books, and they're they're calling you. I'm saying, yeah, talk talk to Arnold. He's my guy. You know, he he can share everything with you. What are some things that they just love when, when these buyers come in that you've done for your clients that they're just like, holy cow, I love this. This is awesome. So what? Sh- and, and, and so that way, I know what should I be doing uh, to make sure that I'm buttoned up. What are some like just really like deal sealers or something that just makes the process go so smooth. Okay. So the, there's two parts to it. One is this is what my business is worth, get an LOI, and then they go into due diligence. If you want to fail due diligence, you don't have any accounts done. So it doesn't really happen with me because all my clients have got their accounts, all their accounts are right anyway. But not having your accounts done, not having them up to date, not having them accurate is just a deal breaker. Now, in that case... That you might sign an LOI, someone's going to buy it for some fantastic number and the business will fail in due diligence and the sale won't go through. So you've got to have your finances, just you know, set of accounts, balance sheet, profit and loss, all up to date. In terms of what they're looking for and what they really like, they're looking for a continually increasing business across all your SKUs. Um, so where we've seen... Now, for the clients who have, have sold their businesses, the ones that have sold are the ones that have their products are just increasing every year. They've got a plan. Um, that's something we're seeing a lot more of. Um, the, the aggregators are actually asking for, what's your plan for the next two years? And some of these people just say, I don't know. <laughs> and you've got to have a plan in there. Just, okay, how do we grow this um, for the next couple of years? The next... Um, Things that are turning people off is when there is a decline along the way. So you might be able to say, oh, the decline's there, but it's seasonal. It happens every year. Um, we ended up with a lot that ended up with a COVID boost. And then post-COVID, uh, it, things just weren't as good. Still great, but just it, if it, they looked at those trends, it seems as though they were going down. And no one wants to buy a declining business. So from your clients that have expanded like beyond the US, maybe they've gone to Europe or Singapore, or Australia, or wherever, where, where do you see that a lot of them pull back from? They're like, ah, let's give this one a shot and France just didn't work. Or, or where do you see that? It, or do you see that? Do you see any patterns there where people try to expand and then they, they, they shrink back up they, just because they can't, just can't make it work in certain marketplaces? Uh, yeah, we see that a lot. Um, we see that a lot when people expand to those marketplaces when they shouldn't, okay? They're in their first couple of years. Okay, don't. Just stick with stick with the US or stick with Europe, ma'am. If you're just going to do, you might go, I'm just going to do UK. Well, then stick with UK and do that properly, you know, UK and Europe. And But don't go into the US as well or just go into the US 
and don't worry about any of these other markets. What happens when you go into these other markets is you end up splitting your stock. So you've got to hold minimum stock quantities at each of those places, which just cost you more and more money. So you're better off just going, okay, I'm just going to do USA, stick with USA, until you've really pushed the line on where that, you know, I can't grow any more in here, and you've got extra cash thinking, what am I going to do with it? Then you can go, okay, let's, let's target Europe um, and move to that market. Well, we see that a lot. I was talking to someone the other day. He was selling everywhere. I said, okay, you've got to stop selling in all those other places and just do the USA because it's just silly. <laughs> I, I agree. Uh, I, I think like the U.S., I mean, it's, I, I don't think there's too much. You're selling in the U.S., it's kind of easy to sell into Canada and doesn't take too much extra, but I wouldn't go beyond uh, that really. What about going to Shopify or to Walmart or any of these other platforms? Uh, are you same thing? You're spreading yourself too thin, different stock, or it's just it's not worth the effort in most cases? Or, or some people will say it is actually, but um, what, what, you, what do you, sense do you get from your clients on, on that? Okay. In terms of Walmart from my clients, um, it's been difficult to sell on Walmart anyway for being an Australian. Uh, you needed to have a social security number to get onto or a resident, you know, a place of residence in the US to sell on Walmart. So we haven't really seen too much of that. But I think it's again the same for Shopify. It's just like, okay, it's it's a diversion. It's a, taking your, your eye off the prize, which is the US. So we usually suggest that people don't even think about going into Shopify for at least a couple of years till they've built up some products. And then all they're going to do at that point is to learn to build up the traffic, organic traffic, <laughs> moving into Shopify rather than, you know, going spending money on Facebook ads to push money to your Shopify site for your three products. It's just not worth it. So that again, Shopify sits at, and we've only just recently opened up our Shopify store, and we do a couple of million. Yeah, I always tell people if you want to have a Shopify, there's no harm really in setting it up just for legitimacy. Just if someone wants to, you know, type in and you you've got you know a few sales, maybe let Amazon fulfill them for you. You know, now with the, the buy with Prime or something like that. But don't put a lot of effort in or money into driving traffic there. Um, not not for a few years, like like you said. But it's no harm in paying probably $30 a month just to have that presence, that legitimizer um, in case you need it. But other than that, it's just, it's not really, not, re not really worth the effort. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, I mean, if you can build the traffic to it, I mean, that's, that's why Amazon's so good. It's got the traffic. The trouble with Shopify, you've, you've got to spend a lot of money to get the traffic there. So if you've got a Shopify store, your object really is that just, okay, how do we drive traffic? It's the same with, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, it's just like, okay, all those things are just about how do you learn to drive traffic to them? And if you can't drive traffic mm -hmm. on them, well, they're useless. And that's why Google is probably the best ones right now for if you're going to drive outside traffic because Google already has the traffic coming to it and in advertising there with the the 10% uh, you know, kickback that Amazon will get you. Some, in some cases, you can make, make that work and actually, uh, but you're not having to to drum it up like you do uh, on P Pinterest or some of the other places. Yeah, we've been. What do you think? Yeah, we've been running um, Amazon attribution from our. Basically, we're not the object is not to get a sale on our Shopify site. The Shopify site has a button on it, buy at Amazon, that has mm -hmm. Amazon attribution <laughs> on it, and just sends them straight there. It's so much easier. Yeah, get ten percent free traffic. Well, Arnold, I really appreciate you taking some time today and uh, sharing with us. This is uh, this has been fun. Uh, if someone wants to, uh, to to get their hands on like one of these spreadsheets, other than Freedom Ticket or one of these other things that you have, uh, or to learn more about you or follow you or reach out to you, if maybe they're want to want to get some services, if you're taking new clients or something, how how would they do that? Okay, the the best place to go is to our website, which is uh, dolmanbateman.com.au so d-o-l-m-a-n bateman b-a-t-e m-a-n dot com dot a-u or just search Arnie Shields and you'll probably find me along the way and if you if you go to dolmanbateman.ampm I'll put a link to a whole bunch of spreadsheets that we've got there um, we've got a really good one it's a massive spreadsheet but I use it religiously um, it's a 52 week cash flow and inventory projection spreadsheet um, so basically we do it a couple of times a year. We work through this spreadsheet and just basically say, okay, this is where our sales are going to be. This is when we have to order stock. 
This is what our cash flow is going to be. Can we afford to grow this fast? Can we afford to order that order that stock at that time? Basically, I go through that with most of my clients as well. Um, and it's just a it's a big spreadsheet, but it just it's just vital in terms of understanding where you're going to be. And it actually gives you once you've done it, it gives you a lot of peace of mind because you know well that's my direction for the next year. All I have to do is make sure the sales happen and order the stock at this time. I should be okay. So that's dolmanbateman.com.au forward slash AMPM. Absolutely. Correct. Awesome. Well, Arnold, I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing you at the next Billion Dollar Seller Summit uh, in Puerto Rico. Hopefully by then uh, those airfares are come down and you got a little bit of time. You can come uh, have some good fun with us. Yeah, because uh, you, as you know, those the billion dollar seller summits a lot of fun, a lot of good information, a lot of good networking. So uh, hope hope to see you uh, see you there uh, next year. Okay, absolutely. Thank you very much, Kevin. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Knowing your numbers when it comes to selling on Amazon is one of the most crucial things you have to get a handle on, and it's going to be one of the biggest factors in your success or your failure or your frustrations when doing e-commerce. If you want to see more, remember Arnold's told you to go to dolmanbateman.com.au forward slash AMPM and grab that spreadsheet. It's a fabulous spreadsheet. So make sure you go there and grab that spreadsheet. It's totally for free. Also, he's in the Freedom Ticket. So if you're a Helium 10 member uh, at any level, you have free access to the Freedom Ticket. It Just go log into your Helium 10 account and you'll see a little button up at the top that says Freedom Ticket. Thanks again uh, for joining me this week. We'll be back again next week with another episode of the AM PM podcast. I'll be talking to the winner of the best hack at the Billion Dollar Seller Summit, someone that just started his own podcast, a big time seller, really smart guy. You're going to really enjoy it. So be sure to check in next week for episode 318. Before we go today, I just want to leave you with these words of wisdom. Success is getting what you want. Fulfillment is giving what you're made for. Success is getting what you want. Fulfillment is giving what you're made for. We'll see you next week.